as as Tally just said, we have been working together for 30 years, and it is uh, as an artist, it's uh, wonderful to have uh, the people that you work with really love your work and talk about your work, and 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 also tell me it's all okay, Linda, <laughs> because as an artist, you're always questioning everything. I don't care how long you do it, you still go, oh, I don't know, I've got to look at that. Um, and But what I wanted to do, I have um, a, a great friend of mine named Lene Glott gave me this book, and it is called Madness, Rake, and Honey. Well, she told me about the book. And um, in this book, uh, Mary Raffel is a poet, and she teaches, I think it's at Bennington College, and these are her lectures. And they're, it's kind of quirky, it's kind of, it's the kind of book that you don't have to start at the beginning and finish it to the end. It's the kind of book that you can just pick it up and read a little bit and then go to sleep. But it's also somehow all of her ideas seem to become part of my mind and embedded into my brain and made my work, I think, stronger. Uh, and there's two things I want to read. Uh, and I hope you'll bear with me. Uh, and then I want to, I uh, will introduce, Emily is a student from uh, UTA in the performing arts program there. And uh, my young assistant who's back there, Ben Loftus, who has been working with me for two years. Uh, I said, I want someone to talk about Hecate and the Shakespeare piece that's in the next room. And, but I know that I am not going to read that very well. I want an actress to do it. And so <laughs> Emily, was, Emily was suggested by the program there, and I'm very excited to work with her, and she's done a lot for her young age, I'll tell you. And so, uh, but I'm going to read my part first, and then she's going to read the speech that's on the other side of this wall of a Hecate's speech and she will give you some more information about Macbeth, won't you? I will. <laughs> <laughs> and so here we go. Here's the, uh, the first thing I want to read. Um, this is, uh, she has little kind of storylines and things, and so this one is, I thought was wonderful. <clears throat> there is the old story of Somerset Mong reading Proust <laughs> while crossing the desert by camel. And to lighten his load, he tore out each page after reading both sides and let it fall behind him. One wants to say the wind was involved, but on most days there was no wind. With or without wind, who had more of a memorable reading experience? Somerset Maugham or the one who came after him? <laughs> The one who found and read a page here, a page there, and in some strange new order with a stellar gap between. <laughs> Is this not a truer experience of in search of lost time or of remembrance of things past? This is how I feel that when we toss our work out <laughs> as you, the viewers, how you receive it, it has to depend on a lot about your memories, your experiences, and how much of the page you choose to view. Um, and so I thought it really expressed what we do as artists. And now this is another one. Uh, she also, Mary also um, would copy down sentences or phrases that were influential to her that she thought needed to be saved and she would put them in her journal. And this is by uh, the poet George Seferis. And uh, I thought it was just a beautiful way of talking about why we make art. Um, but to say what you want to say, you must create another language and nourish it for years and years with what you have loved, with what you have lost, and with what you'll never find again. So with that, I want to introduce 
this time, Emily. Uh, and Emily is going to, I wanted to have a slight stage, so she's going to stand up here. I'm going to help you. I'm going over here. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Macbeth. It's a Shakespearean play, obviously. It is about the Scottish general Macbeth, who is such an amazing general that he has defeated two armies over the course of two days. This really catches the attention of the Scottish King Duncan. And on the way to the king's castle, he runs into three witches. These witches tell him his fate, that he is to become not only a thane of Coswell, but also the king. He doesn't believe them at first, but then he is soon given news that he is now the new thane of Coswell, as the old thane has been executed. So now he believes the witches, but he worries because he's a very passive man. He doesn't want to get his hands dirty. He hopes it'll happen without him having to do anything. But he realizes soon he has to take the matters into his own hands. So he invites the king over to his castle and he kills him in his sleep. And that starts the beginning of a very violent downfall into his defense of his crown. This scene specifically is the three witches being confronted by Hecate. She is the goddess of witchcraft and also their leader. It starts off with the first witch. Why, how now, Hecate? You look angrily. Have I not reason? Bedlams as you are, saucy and overbold, how did you dare to trade and traffic with Macbeth in riddles and affairs of death? And I, your mistress of your charms, the close contriver of all harms, was never called to bear my part or show glory of our art. And, which is worse, all you have done hath been but for a wayward son spiteful and wrathful, who, as others do, loves for his own ends. Not for you, but make amends now. Get you gone, and at the pit of Acheron meet me at the morning. Thither he will come to know his destiny. Your vessels and your spells provide, your charms and everything beside. I am for the air. This night I'll spend unto a dismal and fatal end. Upon the corner of the moon there hangs a vaporous drop profound. I'll catch it ere it comes to ground, and that distilled by magic's lights shall rise such artificial sprites as by the strength of their illusion shall draw on to him his confusion. He shall spurn fate, scorn death, and bear his hopes above wisdom, grace, and fear. And you all know, security is mortal's chiefest enemy. Hark, I am called. My little spirit, see, sits in a foggy cloud and stays for me. Come, let's make haste. She'll soon be back again. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Thank you. <laughs> now, that's something you probably didn't expect from an artist talk. <laughs> but one of the things, the title of this show is Cover Ups and... Um, upon the Moon. Upon the Moon is the name of upon that drawing. Uh, Sorry, Upon the Corner of the Moon. Upon, upon the Corner of the Moon. Thank you. I need Emily a lot. And, um, uh, but basically, uh, one, uh, out of the ti title, you know, um, this is the, the one of the first cover-ups. And this is, uh, just to let you know, this is um, a drawing that um, is based on my own fig tree in my own backyard. You know, I use things that are around me to create things. And the sad part about it is that I'm getting ready to build a new studio. Yay! Uh, <laughs> But I had to cut this beautiful 30-year-old fig tree down, which broke my heart. Just my heart went, mm. So I took a lot of the leaves and preserved them, and I went down to Flatbed Press, and we did impressions. Uh, and then I went and uh, started drawing on it. And um, 
it is a simple circular form, but I, lo I like the idea of how it moves in and out, and I hope you see that feeling there. I have a great love for the cover-ups. Mm -hmm. I've cast them before. In the little ante room there, the library, are two of the dress forms, mm -hmm. the young girl's dresses and the, and the young brother's christening gown. Mm -hmm. Uh, the brother, by the way, of that is Gene Owens, his brother. Gene Owens is a really well-known artist in this area. He's an older artist, a friend of Harry Gefford's, and he gave me the dress about seven years ago. And I didn't know what to do with it, and, but I finally figured out what to do. And uh, that's what that ghost drawing is. And I think everybody assumes that it's because it's a dress, it's going to be a female name. But calling it brother, I thought was so wonderful uh, because it was his brother's dress who passed away quite young. And they never called him anything but brother, which I thought was really interesting. So in that vein, we have things that are about my memories, my feelings, my relationships with my children, my parents, my grandparents. That piece over there with the two long grass drawings that you see, those, um, those are uh, pieces of Johnson grass. Now, on the farm, and when I grew up with my grandma, <laughs> we had lots of Johnson grass. And Johnson grass is an evil grass. <laughs> Uh, as you all may know, you know, and my uh, grandmother always said, you know, it's not good for the cattle and it's tearing up their, you know, when we did the plowing of the corn, look at all that Johnson grass, that's always what she said. And, and I, as a young child, used to kind of run around in the Johnson grass and I loved the feeling of that grass and the, sh the sharpness of it and she was always kind of yelling at me in the corner, Linda, get out of that Johnson grass, you know, get out of that stuff, you know. And mainly because it's very sharp, you know, the edges are very sharp. But I had a kind of affection for it. I just loved how tall it grew. Uh, it, and it just would grow anywhere. And almost like us as people, <laughs> we'll grow anywhere. And, uh, and I, I have to say that when I started working on that piece, I kept hearing my, my grandmother's voice. It made it better. Yeah. Then these pieces, the, this one and this one, um, are pieces that <clears throat> sometimes people give me crochet items. I don't crochet. If I crocheted, I wouldn't be doing this. I would just be crocheting. Uh, and so this is a piece that uh, Gwen McGough gave me. Uh, I guess seven or eight years ago, and the two pieces in there, the guilt and guiltless pieces, she basically crocheted for me. I drew the design of what I wanted, and she made it happen. And, um, but Gwen gave me this, and she got it in. I love, it's kind of like, I feel like I'm on Antique Roadshow or something, but this is, <laughs> the provenance for this is that it came from Michigan. And it was uh, basically just a centerpiece for a table. And these two shapes right here were, were, so you would know where to put your platters, you know, know where to put your cake stands, you know. It was like, it had a real purpose. It wasn't just decorative, it had a way of doing it. Uh, I have done a series of these, of the cut paper pieces. And the reason I do that is I print the crochet, and then I go back in, and I draw the crochet, and out here I stitch each, I actually stitch it with pencils. And so I go back in and draw this. And then the final act is cutting the negative spaces. By cutting the negatives, in the last few years, I would say, I'd say in the last 10 years, a lot of artists have done a lot of cut paper pieces. And um, I really wasn't interested in being it as cut paper. I was trying to give the sense that this is actually a real piece again. In other words, printing oftentimes flattens things. And so going back and reworking the piece, bringing it forward, making depth, I'm actually bringing it back to its objectness, I call it, the objectness of things. And I feel like um, this is just a real simple piece, but I really, really love it. It's very minimal. 
And then this is called uh, Victorian geometry. And, you know, it's just these nice little samples. But again, if you look closely, you can see all the, the, the printed form and then the pencil form. And that's real important to me. It's like uh, when I was a young kid uh, with the, the Benedictine nuns who were so beautifully and <laughs> taught me to read and write, but they would always say to me, uh, Linda, go ahead and you, you draw those maps really well. Why don't you do some more map drawing? You know, and, the <laughs> and I remember at times when I'm drawing, I just feel like Sister Mary Victor is saying, okay, stand up straight, you look people in the eye and draw your maps. And so <laughs> that's how I always felt, you know. Uh, the pieces behind you all are pieces that are uh, natural grass pieces. Uh, the one on your left there, if we're looking at the way I'm looking at it, is um, that is actual Texas broom weed. And, but I felt like it looked like trees. And then the other side here is another, uh, just wild grasses that I walk around in out at the foundry at Harry Gefford's place. And I just love all those wild kind of wonderful grasses. To me, they're beautiful lines. They're nature's, they're nature's signature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I find them just beautiful. And then the lilies over here. This is something new. I didn't think, uh, you know, the lily is is sometimes, uh, you know, a symbol of virginity. It's, uh, you know, in, in the Renaissance, they would always have a lily near the Virgin and and different things. But also, too, today we often think of the lily as a memorial flower for someone who's passed. And this basically was, I, I re had received a lot of lilies. And so I decided, I think I want to see what I can do with it. And actually trying to print this very 3D flower and then going back and drawing on it again was a real feat. And it also, uh, I don't know if you all noticed, but there's a lot of what I call natural juices. Do you see the juices? And it took me a while because I'm insane about precision. I'm crazy about precision. And at first I didn't like the juices. And I just was like, oh God, that's such a mess. I've got to straighten that up. And, but then all of a sudden, the longer I looked at it, the better it got. In other words, it was like the flower helping me to complete the idea. You know, I was in, there's a lot of pollen in here, right? <laughs> and so that basically is what the lilies are about. And I also, this one and this one, I used a lot of color pencils, which I always am very frightened of color. Uh, and when I use it, I do it very sparingly. Uh, but I felt like it needed, the natural juices were so colorful, and I thought, I've got to add some more color to this. And so that was a nice experience for me. It was different and everything. And I think the last piece I wanted to talk about would be the one on the other side of the wall, if y'all want to. I don't know how we can all look at that, but I can just talk about it and you can look at it later. Let's do that. Um, basically, that piece, if you look on the signature thing, it says 2009 to 2019. Now, did I work on it that long? No, but I thought about it that long, and that, <laughs> that's the difference. Uh, that was a, what I call a negative positive print, and it was kind of a negative piece printed in its form, and only, you know, I got just a hint of the white from it. It was basically a sheet of plexiglass that we had inked up, a uh, four foot by eight foot sheet of graphite ink. And then it was, it was a serviceful uh, idea. In other words, I was trying to coat that piece of fabric to get enough ink on it to make it come forward. And so we would just run it through the press, and then I'd move it and run it through the press. And so basically, I got multiple images on it. And I have to basically say, Catherine Brimbury, who I've worked with for years, since 1999, by the way, in prints, uh, she said, Linda, that is really good. And I said, oh, it's awful messy. Look at all that dark, you know. <laughs> and she said, I think, I, 
I think you're going to like this later. Well, she was right. But it took, <laughs> what, 10 years for me to come back and say, that is pretty darn good. And so I wanted to include it in the show. And it was something as a kind of what I call a nice surprise from Linda. Because I usually, this is kind of what people know me for, these kind of delicate, whisper, silent, quiet uh, pieces. And then all of a sudden, you go behind that wall, and it's like, pow, you know. And, um, you should know that artists can do the pal and the quiet. Uh, and I think that's kind of what that piece is about. The dress form came from my son, who's a costume designer in Austin, very proud of him. Uh, and he, is, he had used, this was an inner lining of the actual witch Hecate, and he was gonna throw it away. And he said, Mom, I got this stuff. I think maybe you might like it. And I said, well, let me look at it. And it was just in rags. It was just almost a rag. And, but I could see that I was going to find something in there. And um, so I printed it, and I did find something. Uh, so what am I saying? I guess uh, we all get along with the help of our friends and family. <laughs> Thank you. Can, can you walk me through the, the activity of printing? Uh, you're, you're embossing the paper and a, on a... On a with an act, with a, yes, I am. But I'm using an actual uh, real leaf or twig yeah. or branch, which actually, after it goes through the press, and you have to do a lot of experimenting because you can't just throw a branch on there uh, because you, you'll tear the paper. There's all kinds of different stress levels that you use. And I really don't want a good print. Uh, that's going to sound really crazy. But what I want is what we call ghost printing. I want just the, the after effect of the way it just falls in. And then that gives me the... I don't know, the excitement of mapping it out, of drawing on top of it, of printing and drawing. I love the combination of, you know, first printing something. I do the same thing with my bronze. I actually use real leaves, real flowers. Uh, so this is not foreign in any way. In fact, it really fits well into the bronze format that I do. Is, is, is the, 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 the leaf, has it been inked and then run through or is it no. just, is just whatever comes out of the... the right. Uh, the, what it has, what it has is that I oftentimes, some inks, sometimes they are, sometimes I do a roller ink mm -hmm. and I'll take that back. I did roller ink this, but um, um, I, I did it so lightly. I don't know how to explain that other than I just wanted to get the sense of the leaf form, but I didn't want a lot of information. I knew I would put the information and that's the part I enjoy doing. Were the leaves green? Why did they, they were green. Crack and break up. <laughs> because I had, remember I said that my, I had taken this uh, plant and I had preserved the leaves. They were still green in color, but they had no more of the, I have to have a science major. What is that green stuff? The chlorophyll. The chlorophyll. The chlorophyll. Thank you. It's all gone. <laughs> it was all gone. And so I didn't get any color. Now, the Johnson grass, was I, I, I just plucked that right out of the field <laughs> and uh, because it was so fresh I got a lot of wonderful things and you can't control it you know and um, you you just can't um, but I don't even want to I, so I think sometimes as an artist especially I know for myself I am uh, I'm very I want to I you know everything has to be just right and so by printing it first, it loosens me up, and, and it's like a gesture. I just get relaxed about it. And it's only a piece of paper. If it doesn't, if it doesn't work, I throw that one away and do another. I mean, it's not like, um, you know, that I've, you know, it's just like it's the starting point. The printing process is just the start, and it's only there to kind of help me deal with the arrangement on the Per paper, the surface, how much, you know, like if you look over there at the lily, it's, it's not dead center. And uh, when I did that, 
Uh, I didn't like it at first. Uh, and I think I'm going to say this to all young artists here. If you don't like it, just put it in a drawer and come back to it. Because you might, and that was one that I put in a drawer too. I didn't know if I liked it. Yeah. I own your monopen. I don't know whether you remember it or not. It's pink slip. Oh, wow. Yeah, That's an old one. Yeah. And I have it's a cover-up, too, by the way. And how in the world is just, it's a monoprint of a slip. Mm -hmm. And did you go back and look oh, yeah. at the color? How did you go about that? I have studied that thing. It's by my dad, and I look at it every day. <laughs> <laughs> and I have not figured it out. So can you well, I, I play with different colored pencils, and it was drawn off with colored pencils. And I did that to make it more dimensional. Uh -huh. Printing is never enough for me. But you put the slip down first. I printed. I did. And then came back and added it. And, and drew like crazy on it. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, it looks like, oh, she just printed it. Well, that's, no, 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 even no, just no. printing it is, is just a, a feat in itself. Like I said, I, I print things extremely light. It's almost like, it's, it's kind of hard to see sometimes. But I like that because I, I have so many more options. I have whites. If I printed it heavy and dark, I'd lose my whites. Yes. Uh, that was one of the things with the, with the uh, upon the corner of the moon. Yes. It's got a, I, I erased that drawing more than I drew that drawing. Mm -hmm. And erasing is, is, is a, almost as big a part of a drawing as drawing it. Mm -hmm. Figuring out what to take away and how much to take away, you know. And my studio at home is pretty small. And so what I would do is I put it on this wall and then I go outside my door <laughs> and I look at it <laughs> to see, to kind of see what I'm doing. And you just don't see that up close. Up close, I see every little thread or dark or light and I and but you have to get away and be the viewer you guys are the viewers right and artists I, I know some of you are you're the viewer and so it's kind of like the tossed page in the desert floor mm -hmm. how you see it at different times is how we look at our work you know, at times we see it as finished, it's done. At other times we put it in a drawer, we come back, and sometimes we say, oh, it's too much. Well, I'm just going to erase that whole drawing, mm -hmm. you know. And I've done stuff like that, too. Erase it and then just go back and choose what I call the precise moment of creation. In other words, it's like, I'm, ooh, that line is so great. <laughs> I, get, I get happy. Thank you. Thank you all for coming.